We will then, we can have a little discussion. We will put that online. There will be an online forum, eventually an online poll, and we will collectively decide what Chobimala 9 is going to be about. So keep thinking on that. This was billed as a talk, but I realized that we had some great people here who had very, very useful things to contribute. So we've turned it around a little bit, and we'll make it more of a conversation, because uh, here, James Estrin from the Lens blog, the co-editor of the Lens blog, he's also a working photographer for the New York Times, you know, someone right in the heart of the industry, certainly in terms of both the blog, but also with the newspaper itself. So here's someone who uses some of the work that we produce in mainstream media. We also have Daru, is that how you pronounce your name? OK. Uh, we met some time back in Islamabad. Uh, we were both following Greg Mortensen uh, and visiting him as he went to schools and things like that. And we've stayed in touch. But Daru was the founder of Lightstalkers, which you will know about but at the moment plays a very important role. I'll let him describe what that role is, but plays a very important role in Instagram. And I think in that sense, we have people who use the work that we do in very interesting ways and have a, a lot to offer us. What I'm going to do is merely set the context a little bit. I'm talking from a photographer's perspective, though I also run an agency, run a school, and and I'm involved with this festival. But all of that has to do with, in the end, what happens to this product that we produce, the image. And I'd just like to open up that question. Uh, can I ask you why you took the picture? Those of you who are photographers, or even non-photographers, we have a mobile phone. That makes us a photographer. So why do you take pictures? Anyone? You love the moment to be captured, yeah? So to preserve that moment in some way. Anything else? Any one of you? And it's a free for all. There's no right answers. To record information, similar in that sense. Anything else? To tell a story. You have something to say. You have a statement to make. Anything else? Some of the things which we don't actually say, but for photographers can be quite important. I mean, some photographers I know want the fame. Photography is a glamorous profession. And you can be a, a star, you can be known. And particularly if you're doing celebrity photography or war photography, I know a lot of photographers, or a lot of people aspiring to be photographers, who want the fame. It's OK. I think it's, it's just good to know why it is. There are people who want the money. Nothing wrong with it. And it, you know, it, and it, it needs to be accepted. And certainly, even if we do it for other purposes, making money out of it is not insignificant in terms of what our requirements are. So if that is one of our goals, I think it's good to be upfront about it. Yeah? OK. Um, James did say that the cultures in Bangladesh and America where in the United States, they'd probably start with money first and other things later. But We'll, we'll come to that later. You talked about what happens with it, what you can do with it, and the politics of it. Certainly in my case, the politics was very important. I, I took on photography because I recognized its value and the fact that it had, it was a powerful weapon. There are photographers who take pictures because they enjoy taking pictures. Well, nothing wrong with that. People, Terry was actually telling me that earlier on, that early, at, at the earlier stage, that was, for you, a major motivation. You actually enjoyed creating that photograph. Yeah? It was only motivation in his case. Um, there are photographers who like to travel. And photography does allow you to travel. So I'm saying these things because I think it's worthwhile in our own minds to be clear about why we do what we do. Because that determines the strategy we will take on later on. And each of those, and there might well be more, requires a different strategy. Yeah? And I will also say that they're not mutually exclusive. 
fame might actually make you money. The, the fact that it might give you pleasure. So those could be related. Sometimes they're not. Sometimes you might actually sacrifice one for the other. And certainly in, if your political convictions are such that it makes it difficult for you to operate, by being successful from a political perspective, you might actually be less successful uh, in terms of making money or the other things. Sometimes they work. Sometimes you travel. Sometimes you don't. It dep depends upon what sort of photography you practice. But there are lifestyle choices that are dictated by each of those attributes. And we need to identify what they are, because then we also need to recognize that those are the lifestyle choices that I have. And whether those lifestyle choices are choices we're prepared to live with are important questions we need to ask ourselves. Because at the end of the day, if that is what you want, you also need to accept that, OK, if that's what I want, this is what I need to do. And am I OK with that? Some are, some are not. So what else, who else do you need? We work in isolation, but certainly if we're trying to follow those goals, then there are other things we might well need. So let's start with one of them. With fame, if you want to be famous, what do you need? Very good. You need fans. You also need people to promote you. Yeah? So those are key ingredients we need. If you want money, what do you need? You need a credit card, yes, perhaps. Yeah, good, OK, fair enough. Uh, sorry? You need a market. You might need investments. You might need business acumen. You might be a great photographer. You might not be a great business person. So if money is what you're going to make, then those are skills you will need to pick up. If politics is your issue, if social change, if ideology is the issue, what do you need? Sorry? Another audience, a constituency. Yeah, very good. You might need a party. You might need, you know, you might need organizational expertise. You might need lobbyists. You might need strategists. Those are part of what you will have to have in order to be successful or not. If you do it for the fun of it, what do you need? If you're doing it for pleasure, you love phot photography, you love creating a picture, what do you then need? Yeah, a camera, good one. Okay, it's a starting point. Do you need something else? You need independence, you need money. Because unless you have that, if you have to pay the bills at the end of the month, just taking pictures for the fun of it isn't going to work. Yeah? If you have a sugar daddy, that's different. <laughs> <laughs> but well, so we, we need to recognize that. And then, yeah, you might, you might consider ma marrying into a wealthy person, family as one of the career options if you want to take pretty pictures. But all of those need to come in. You also need an environment that's that facilitates in some way. For you to really enjoy photography, you need to be in a stimulating environment which allows you that, that space to savor the photograph that you want. Let's now come to the things we're going to need and where these excellent colleagues of mine will, will play their role. But the tools that we need to have in order to do some of the things we do. Today, online presence. You can't ignore that. Yeah. There was a time when you could perhaps have gotten away with it. I don't think today you can. For any of the things that we talked about, you need an online presence, except maybe for the pleasure part. There, uh, you create this nice picture, sit in a dark room, look at it, admire yourself. You don't need online presence. But apart from that, you generally do. Yeah? In order to get ahead, in order to convince other people in order to be able to survive, you probably also need presentation skills. You need to be able to get our, your ideas across. You need to be able to convince other people. You need to be able to take on board. And if you need fans, if you need all the other things, having good presentation skills are important. Yeah? And they're not natural. They don't, being a good photographer doesn't mean you're necessarily a good presenter of your photographs. And it's important to know the difference. You do need a certain degree of industry know-how to be able to fundraise, to recognize what business trends are, 
aesthetic trends, publishing trends, what's happening to the publishing industry. Right now, it's quite interesting, newspapers in most countries, certainly in the West, are plummeting. Sales of newspapers, sales of hard copies are plummeting. In Bangladesh, they're on the rise. In South Asia, generally, they're on the rise, but in Bangladesh in particular. You have a country with a relatively low level of literacy, yet there are new newspapers popping up every day. And they, they, they're certainly in strong positions. The art market, if my work has to be sold in a gallery, if my work is, if I'm trying to sell prints, if I want my work to go to museums, then I need a different type of knowledge. Uh, and they are not the same. You know, you might have a great photojournalist who has no clue about the fine art market, about museums. So if that is where, what my, where my interest lies, I need to understand that, find the chemistry of that. Another thing which is happening, particularly with professional photographers, because now the same type of business opportunities as used to exist do not, there are a lot of photographers who actually now make a living through education, who are teachers. They do some photography, particularly if you've made a name for yourself as a photographer, you can then actually cash in that name through teaching, through high quality workshops or things like that, or even through universities or other situations. And there are many, many models. <coughs> Certainly, many of the agencies today, I know Magnum, Noor, Seven, does Panos it? I don't know. No, not yet. <laughs> OK, but many of the agencies, and for instance, with Magnum, I know that their workshops are expensive, but they're also sponsored. So you have a sponsor putting in money. You have the people participating putting in money. And the photographers, over a week, will make five, six, seven thousand dollars $7,000, yeah. which is not bad, considering daily rates with the New York Times are not quite so high. 250 overseas, 200 low. That's not very high. So, of course, you need something else as well. You need photographic skills. And do note that I brought mentioned that right at the end. Because there is this assumption that photographic skills is all that it's about. It is a very important part of it. But in fact, a very tiny part of us being successful in what we do. And what I'll do having said that, is merely talk in terms of my own situation as a photographer, why I got it, how I got into it, and then I think we bring on uh, this discussion. So in my particular case, it was very clear. I was, I was involved with the Socialist Workers' Party. I was, as, as someone very conscious of social inequalities, I recognized that here was a tool that I could use. In the process of doing so, one of the things, certainly when I came to Bangladesh, I realized that the picture industry required agencies. Photographers needed agencies. How else, sitting here in Bangladesh, how would I get my work out to the rest of the world? I started with an agency in London called Impact Photos. I wasn't very happy with our relationship. And more importantly, I recognized that working with an agency out there might work for me because I had you know, good language skills, I had the access, and they knew my work. But they said they needed 300 good quality color transparencies before they'd take me on. Now, for most Bangladeshi photographers, 300 good color transparencies is a huge deal. And they also said, give us three years, then come back. Don't ask for money in between. You know, if you've spent all that time and effort putting 300 trannies together, you want to get paid for it. You don't want to wait for three years. So we set up an agency, and one of the things we did in the agency is, if a photographer had one good picture to sell, we'd take that picture, try and sell it, and give him or her the money so she could go out and buy some more film and carry on working. It had to be a very different model. And, you know, that model was going to work in our case. We started that, also it was a question through our work of addressing some of the issues and challenging the stereotypes and all that, but then, in terms of the social movement, I very quickly realized that if I'm to fight a battle, I need soldiers. The weapons themselves will not be enough. Photography, a great tool, great weapon, but I do need soldiers. So that's when we actually started teaching at the agency itself. We had 
people like Martin Barr and other people coming running workshops. The workshops were great. When we did, came to the next workshop, it was down again. You had to almost start from scratch. So I realized that, look, there has to be a different model. And a production unit, an agency, is not the best teaching environment necessarily. It's for internship, perhaps, but it's not really a school. So we partnered with World Press. What happened was World Press started, I was instrumental in that, convincing them that we should really reach out. At that time, World Press was largely dealing with Western uh, photographers. And I was able to convince them that really they needed to reach out to the majority world. And one of the things we started was a series of workshops, four workshops, Bosnia, Herzegovina, Zimbabwe, Peru, and Bangladesh. Four workshops that World Press was going to do. The idea was they would do three-day workshops separated by a year. So three days, one year, another three days, one year, another three days. And I said, look, it's never going to work. You know, you, you go in there, great, they have a lovely time, they do great stuff. You're going to go away for a year and you expect them to continue working and produce all that stuff. And then when you come back, you just continue where you left off. Rubbish. But I realized it was an opportunity. So what we did was, on the 18th of December, 98, when we had the first workshop, and we had Chris Boot, who had just left Magnum and joined Faden, and Reza Dighati as, as the tutors, and we launched our school at the same time. So we had a great three-day workshop. They went off. I continued working with that small group of people, worked for the year. So when they came back, they, our kids were ready. And that meant we actually ended up being the most successful of those four countries because we'd actually had the building blocks along the way. At the end of that year, the students said, we want to continue. And of course, we, we took on for the next year. World Press stopped, but we didn't. We continued. So we were able to utilize that opportunity to actually build the school. At that time, they were mostly borrowed people. People like Reza and Chris are very fine professionals, but you don't get them all the time. I arm twisted other people at various stages um, to come along. And uh, we had the school. But what has happened now is, at that time, during that year in between, initially, I was the only local teacher. Then there was a woman called Kirsten Clare from Britain, not a particularly well-known photographer, but very dedicated. She came, and the two of us continued the teaching. So we were the only two teachers. Today, out of our 26 teachers, 24 are former students. People like Wasif and Tanzim and Abir and all these people. Abir was from the first batch. Two of them have now, well, Wasif is about to leave day after tomorrow to be in the jury of World Press. Abir has been in the jury of World Press. So we've got the next generation not only teaching, but also in places like the jury of World Press and other situations. So that transformation is taking place. And today, they are the ones who drive it. But then, so we had the school, we had the agency, we had the school. We still didn't have a festival. And the festivals are out there, great festivals, but not much use to all the people sitting here. How do they get to them? So we brought the festival to Bangladesh. And those are the building blocks. And since then, we've set up Majority World, the agency, which now represents photographers in Asia, Africa. We now know that within Asia, we've been able to make a difference. But there are still many parts of the world where that help is needed. So all of that has been part and parcel of the purpose, in my case. It might be very different for someone else. And the solutions will be different for other people. And because of that, I want to bring in my two friends and colleagues to talk about their spaces, and then we'll have a discussion. I, I think rather than a lecture, it could be more like a jam session, perhaps. James. OK. Um, I, uh, I started photographing when I was 16. And I knew fairly quickly I wanted to be a photographer. I actually wanted to be Eugene Smith um, before I knew exactly how miserable he was. But, um, <laughs> but I, my, you know, my purpose has always been uh, to tell stories, uh, to tell all kinds of stories, but always interested, I was often interested in social issues, and um, to explore the world around me. And the path I took, which was partially economic and partially perhaps fear, 
uh, <laughs> was uh, daily newspaper photography. And I um, freelanced for many years. I uh, finally got a job at the New York Times when I was 35. I'd been freelancing for five years before there. And um, I've tried to always have my own stories along the way. Because that, that's, you know, for what I wanted to communicate, it worked well because I wanted my photos to be seen. And before the internet, it was really hard to get your photos seen. So for me, the New York Times was a, almost as good as I could get. Now, I could probably, there were some places I could get more eyes, but I probably couldn't get more political leaders or more, you know, leaders in other fields. So. For me, I was very lucky because I, I was able to accomplish what I wanted. The trade-off was uh, I was never able to do really long-form work. And uh, so, you know, I, I happen to love daily newspaper photography. It fits, all of my weaknesses fit in there perfectly. I have ADD, so every day it's something different. I, uh, I'm neurotic about being on time, as you saw this morning. <laughs> and um, so that's the key to being a newspaper photographer before anything else is being on time. Everything else is secondary. And um, so it, uh, you know, for, for me, it worked out really well. You know, I think that, that you know, as a co-editor of Lens, I talk to a lot of people and you know, everyone, there's a different strategy that can work for them for, I think you laid out in a really smart way, what is it you want? And often it's more than one strategy. It's, the strategy is complex. It is not one thing you do. You know, you don't, you don't just do this one thing, particularly in this world. You don't just pursue it this way. Uh, it might be you know, uh, galleries, it might be, you know, you want exposure on the web. Uh, in places like Lens, it might be, uh, particularly in social issues, Instagram can be really, and, and Facebook can be spectacular. Um, it, again, it depends what you want. You know, if you, there's a, you know, you can, want, you can do, even if you do work in isolation for yourself, I mean, deep down you want people to see it. <laughs> Otherwise, you wouldn't be actually making the pictures. So you, you want the eyes. You want, perhaps you want assignments, perhaps... You know, you, whatever you want, you have to develop a strategy, and usually the strategy is multi-tiered today. I think that probably 25 years ago it didn't have to be. You could say, I'm an editorial photographer, and go out and try to and get assignments. And if you got assignments, then you got more assignments and more assignments, and you can make a living. But today, most every, it doesn't have, the, almost no one has jobs, and those editorial photographers are doing they're teaching, you know, they're, they're out and promoting themselves on Instagram. Uh, you know, and if you're art photographers, maybe you're doing installations in public, you're still promoting yourself. Uh, so, you know, I, I think we need to look at, it's all individual cases, and it starts with what do you want and what, is the, what are the parameters of the project? What does the project need? What do you need and what the project needs? I'd just like to bring in one other thing I think which is relevant. It's also who you are. Not everyone is good at everything. Yeah, there are some people who are good at selling. There are other people who are good at taking pictures. There are some who are very sociable. There are some, And in a sense, you need to find out where within that space your own personality fits. And based on that, try and find, ideally, some sort of a match. Because you, know, you might not be the right person for a particular type of career. And it's best to recognize that and adapt accordingly. Okay. Well, I guess I might be that person who made photographs, at least originally, for no other purpose other than making them. And I actually, I, it did not matter to me if anybody ever saw them. Um, so I was uh, saying earlier, sorry. Um, I think originally for me, when I first saw an image appear in the developer, that's when it was done for me, and that's all I needed from it. And after that, all I was really interested in was getting back out. So, um, and I remember when I met my first photo agent, he was absolutely horrified to hear that I was sitting on top of boxes and boxes of years of photographs from Afghanistan that nobody had ever seen. Um, but that's 
originally that's all I cared about was the experience itself. Um, and I think over the years of photographing in places like Afghanistan and Iraq and Pakistan, you know, this region, the everything else became primary for me. And so if we start with that kind of frame of reference, that the purpose of photographing is to communicate, then what becomes really interesting about this conversation, I guess, and all the things that I've heard you kind of refer to, is basically the infrastructure. You know, when you talk about making transparencies or paying for plane tickets or the role of agencies or newspapers or publishers, all of that has changed so radically now, where the infrastructure itself is kind of open and accessible to anybody. And now primarily what I do at Instagram is I work with a team that produces a couple of Instagram posts a day. And those posts, you know, conjunction with a couple of tweets and a couple of Facebook status updates, I think reach something on the order of like 150 million people a day. And that to me is pretty remarkable, that that shift in an era between a time when that idea that freedom of the press belonged to those who could pay for one or those who could own one, that kind of framework, I think, has gone. And that's the really interesting paradigm shift that keeps me interested in all of this. We could continue talking, but it might be interesting to take some questions as well. I think it's, you know, some very interesting things have been raised. And here you have, really, the opportunity to tap these people's personal experiences. So if you have questions, fire away. Otherwise, we'll continue blabbing. Yeah? Okay. I'm going to ask uh, you something, then, um, which you said was really hard to do in two minutes, but I'm going to ask you to do it anyway. Uh, could you explain this project that you did? Um, because the uh, base track, uh, using Facebook, because I think I've met people here who are very interested in engaging their subjects uh, and going beyond the traditional relationship and communication. And I think that was an early example of it and a powerful uh, use of, of social media. Before this, I just asked, like, can we like not talk about this? Because it's like... This is like two years ago and like or three years ago and it's just I'm so tired of talking about this project. But well, you need to hear it if you don't thank you. Um, so I guess I ended up specializing in photographing things that I was told that nobody cared about. So the endless war in Afghanistan, for example. Um, and at some point I was invited uh, to come photograph this Marine battalion in southern Afghanistan by a commanding officer who had been embedded with literally, I think, six years earlier in another part of Afghanistan. Um, and this was at the time when Afghanistan was being referred to as the Forgotten War. And according to everything that everybody that I worked with told me, like nobody was interested, nobody wanted to know about this, and there was no audience for it, and it's pointless to do this. And I fundamentally didn't believe this. Um, and I still believe this, like when people told me that uh, people are not interested in journalism or people don't care about things. And uh, to me, that just points to, I think, a failure of the people who have been practicing journalism to communicate. Because I have not experienced anything uh, that tells me that that's true. Every time I actually connect with people, the response is, where has this been? So with this project, um, basically, when I, was, when I was asked to come uh, in bed with this, with this Marine unit, you know, I said, Let me, I'll, I, I'd really like to do it. I want to bring some other people. And I brought a team of photographers. We embedded with this Marine battalion. And we kind of skipped the newspaper and magazine part and just went straight for social media. Um, because through social media and through social networks, we basically had the, uh, this infrastructure to tap the social graph of this Marine unit. So, a 1,000 Marines in southern Afghanistan translates to, I don't know how many brothers and sisters and husbands, wives, mothers, fathers, etc., next door neighbors. And I know they care. And that's who we went after. Um, and to me, what we did as photographers was very sort of incidental. It was like a trigger. We put pictures online 
What was actually really interesting is the conversations that started happening in this family network around the pictures. And it's, it's actually the first time I've ever had empirical evidence that photography has any impact, in my, for, you know, or photography that me or my friends have produced, because so six, or seven, six months into a seven-month battalion, we're essentially disinvited from hanging out with this Marine unit. Um, and at some point, somebody showed me an email uh, from somewhere in the Pentagon that says, detach the embed. He's very effective. And, you know, I'd never had a job at that point, but I remember thinking, like, wow, one day if I ever had a job, this is the kind of performance review that I would like. <laughs> so that's, the, that's that story. And you can see um, the website's down, but you can find it on, uh, there's a, it's been written about a lot. And there's photos. I know we wrote about it online, so I'm sure many other people did. But I just thought it was an interesting mm -hmm. example. Yeah. The, the other thing I think is really important to talk about uh, in the process of doing work, I think there's sort of two opposing ways of looking at when you do engagement. So is the question that you produce your work, and then you pivot, and you get people to look at it. Uh, or do you push it out while you're doing it? I think it depends on the type of project, obviously, and what your goals are. Uh, so um, some people are uh, you know, actually using Instagram or Facebook, particularly Instagram, you know, to actually Instagram while you're doing a project, which to me, I think it's just because of my age, feels weird unless I have a social, my goal is social you know, to affect people, in which case it sounds perfect. At the same time, though, I'm not built that way. I'm built that, uh, you, I've learned that you do the work, and you focus on the work, you do it, and then you put it out when it's done, which I still think has a great deal of value, not in every situation, but I think it does in some, because um, I think that people are publishing work, and I'm not talking Instagram, I'm talking on the web, way before they're done. There's so many places to get your works in. There's certain types of long-term stories that you need to be inside. And to, the difference between good work and great work is the extra time and passion. So for certain stories, I mean, I, I often tell people with work that I would publish, not to publish until you're done. Publishing, it changes your relationships with people. You know, but at other times I say do, you know, you should Instagram, you know, some photos while you're doing it and build an audience, you know, um, as well. What do you... To me, actually, like, I almost have the opposite perspective, where what seems to me weird is this idea that as photographers or journalists, we go to the, these far extremes to report on these things that we consider so important that we have to document them and then we don't tell anybody about it. And we kind of like hoard these images or these ideas until some point in the future where somebody will publish it for us. Or it's been sufficiently packaged or paid for to the point where we can actually deem it releasable. And you know, I've had stories that have been published two years after I photographed them, and that's considered normal. And that, to me, is fundamentally well, weird. Well, I, I think, again, it depends on the type of story. So. If you do an intimate story with a handful of people, the moment you publish anywhere, it changes your relationship. It ch can change your access in a very negative way, but it changes the relationship. So in a sense, your um, involvement uh, in documenting it, uh, you've already affected the situation. So I think in many situations, I, 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 I'm not dissing the idea of Instagram, I'm just saying, at all, because I, I think it's fabulous, and I think it can be such an effective tool in some stories. But an intimate story, I, I, from my experience of doing intimate stories, it can be an issue because it automatically changes it. It can uh, actually end your relationship, even depending. So I just think, and also if you're doing certain kinds of you know art projects, it depends on what you're doing. There's a rule that's spectacular but I don't think it should be an automatic default. That's what I think. And I understand what you're saying about you know, the possibility that people seeing the work that you're producing affecting their interest in letting you do it, but that's actually kind of, I think, in many ways, a more honest approach. If what you're 
creating somehow upsets people that you're photographing, well, maybe they have the right to know that. And I've also had the opposite experience mm -hmm. where I photographed, I mean, actually, the last time I was in Afghanistan, I was embedded with this other Marine unit, and I was only supposed to be there for a few days, but the wives of the unit commanders um, were following me on Instagram and liked seeing pictures of their husbands, so they told their husbands to let me stay. So... I think that... I, 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 I don't want to... I don't want to hide the photos from the people I'm photographing in any way. That's not what I'm saying. No, and I understand I sometimes hide there's the practical... from the public because it then affects the people in a different way. So I'm not saying, you know, that, uh, you know, keeping it to myself, you know, to not have that relationship, because you're right. It's always you need a two-way relationship. You know, it's not you coming in. It uh, has to, to do it well, it has to be a partnership. Yeah, but I understand. That doesn't mean you need to share it in, in public, because, I mean, from, in all of my experience of an intimate story, one family, one person, all of my experiences, you, when you publish it, it can be a perfect experience, and I've had that often, you know, and then I keep on with the story, but it's always, it's not exactly the same. It, I mean, it can help your access, but it's like, you know, a law of physics. I, I don't saying. think these are mutually, ex you know, exclusive, you know, ideas, but my experience is photographing for over a decade in Iraq and Afghanistan and seeing roughly a five year lag between things that are completely obvious to everybody on the ground and the public that the media was supposed to be reaching. So everything from corrupt governments to untenable strategies, all of these things, completely obvious to anybody who is seeing it on the ground. So most of the things that you know, we were hearing about in 2007 in Iraq, you know, anybody on the sidewalk in Baghdad could have told you in 2003 or four. Well, but I think Afghanistan gets a perfect use of it, and it makes it obvious. There's a question there, yeah? You could introduce yourself. My name is Ghulam Monor Kamal. I used to work in Afghanistan in uh, 2001 to 2006. So anyway, uh, I'm going to, I, I lived six months in Toronto and six months in Dhaka uh, since 2012. Uh, I'm going to bring a new, uh, new uh, question to the, our uh, panel, uh, but based on two experiences. One, in Toronto, uh, if you go to the city uh, website, you can download the apps, uh, which allows you, you can take a photo or a picture of any damage on the road, and it automatically go to the city hall and they come and repair. Another story is I was in, uh, uh, in the Kukri Mukri, one of the islands last week, which is the southernmost island in the country. And I was talking to, to seven young uh, fishermen, and none of them uh, cross primary school, but all of them have a smartphone. And um, the, the purpose of a smartphone is to watch uh, video and taking photos sharing big fish. When they find big fish, they take the photo, send it to the local market. So they have a kind of unofficial auction. So my question to the, to the panel, are you, uh, in the future, when every citizen will have his, you know, a smartphone, uh, most of them, and everybody will be taking photos and little videos, and where will be the role of photography? Mm -hmm. Because uh, is there a uh, in a fine line, or because every citizen will have the capacity to the best resolution, best quality photos, uh, where we are in as a photographer. <laughs> yeah, so we, you have to come tonight. Okay, uh, <laughs> I, I'll give you a little bit of context because. Now, having decided to set up DRIC in Bangladesh, not in New York, not in Paris, not in London, I was far, were far removed from the marketplace. We had to stay relevant. If you go to send pictures, we still needed to be out there. So one of the things we did in the early 90s was to set up Bangladesh's email network. Yeah. So there are a whole lot of things you need to do if you run an agency, particularly in a country like Bangladesh. And, uh, Teru was talking earlier on about everyone having access. I, I disagree, because at that time, 35% of people in Bangladesh had electricity, 
let alone all that. And I remember writing an article about when a modem costs than a cow. And you had to calculate those things. The shifts are taking place. And you're right that there will come a time when all of us will have smartphones, we'll be able to send off stuff. But there is another side to it. When there is so much happening for work to be seen, it's not sufficient to take it and post it. You actually need a whole lot of other mechanisms to ensure that your work rises to the surface. How does your get work get found? Yeah. How do you get that reach? How do you make it viral? Are all strategies that have to be developed. I would, before I hand it over, come into something else which was touched upon, and I think in a way it relates to. Let's assume there is a photographer, Bangladeshi photographer, working in a village in Bangladesh, doing something, let's say, taking a picture of a farmer. In that situation, the person who's the most knowledgeable about the situation is probably the farmer. The next most knowledgeable person is probably the photographer because of the proximity in what he or she has known. If it's being used by New York Times, the least knowledgeable is probably the person out there in New York Times. Ironically, the most powerful person in the chain is the person in the New York Times. And the farmer in the field has zero say in how that picture gets used or how it's translated. So that is a very complex mechanism that needs to be dealt with. And I think social media does allow us now to, in a way, intervene in that power chain. And I find that very, very interesting. Yeah, I, I think it does. Um, <clears throat> it's something that we focus on a great deal in Lens, is sort of is that issue of representation. How people are, <laughs> how, uh, how people are represented and if they're represented in an honest, accurate manner. And uh, we are removed, but we try very hard. We talk to the photographer. It's actually, we write about the photographer as well. So, you know, we're, we, unlike a traditional editorial setting, the photographer's voice is very heard in it, and even in the edit. But, um, <coughs> you know, it's a responsibility for the media that is left standing to uh, you know, to be aware of that relationship and try to inquire as much as possible to know who it is you're dealing with as a photographer. So the ver you know, essentially the veracity and honesty of the photographer. And then to listen to the photographer. And in different settings, there are more or less of that relationship. Often, there's none of the relationship. Particularly, let's say it's for a wire service and there's no intermediary. And I think given the broad length of news publications, we do reasonably well. And I, I think we're not talking about Lens, but the New York Times. But there's many publications that you put your work out on one way or, or the other, and there's no context. You know, if you put it out in the wind, if it's blowing any possible way, it's actually one thing I would say about where you choose <coughs> when you're figuring out your plan is as far as promoting work, where you choose uh, to have your story told, you know, you want to, if there's a story you care deeply about, you want to try to have a voice in that. You want to try to, you know, make sure it's, 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 it's you know, on a site that's going to, you know, listen to you and be respectful and not be sensationalistic and turn it completely the opposite. Because once you give your photos up, um, you know, if you don't try desperately to have some control, you then have none in media, not social media. About the audience, what does the audience desire? I mean, does the audience? That's that's a question that I think is. talked about a lot in some way. We're all talking about the mechanism of the delivery, but what does audience actually desire? Yeah, uh, audience? sorry, go on. And, and, and also what's the level of, who is that audience and what's the level of engagement? Oh, well, I, I'll take it on. Uh, 
because I think that is one of the areas where new media makes a difference. I think new media is a two-way street. And for the first time, there are two things. One is, I think the individual photographer today has a power that he or she never had before. Uh, and there is, there are stories that I know will never get published. But I have the opportunity to put it up there, to circulate it, to make my statement. That has other repercussions, and I need to take that on board. As a result of that, it might make me ostracized. It might mean I'm not getting work, certain types of work, because I'm identified in a particular way. But if that is the purpose of what I'm doing, certainly I can do it. The feedback is something which is interesting. We did a story called Crossfire, uh, which was on extrajudicial killings, which was used in Len's blog. But one of the things we did there was we put up a Google Earth map within which we placed pointers for all the killings that had taken place. And it was made public so people could actually report on the stories and talk about what had happened there. Actually, it didn't work. And the reason it didn't work is also interesting because people were intimidated because of surveillance, the government was watching Facebook and things like that. We then tried another tack. We made exhibition sets, very cheap mobile exhibition sets, which we gave off to people, initially to human rights groups, and they were scared. They weren't prepared to take it on. Eventually, we found a small group of people who then took it on, set it up in a school playground, in a football field, or somewhere else, and small groups of people gathered. And through that, over, and now that with mobile phone, there were people taking pictures, sending it back, and slowly they began a critical mass. And then people found their own strength. So it's not a straightforward thing. There's, there's many things. But certainly new media does allow a movement in the other direction, which generally doesn't happen. But I'll just end with one thing. There are many ways in which this can be done. And there's a newspaper called the Daily Star in Bangladesh, the leading English newspaper. And even before we had internet, I mean, when I started, we had offline email using FidoNet. So we didn't have access to internet. But we published a page on the Daily Star called Live from the Internet. And essentially, we would write letters to the newspaper. They would publish it. We would take that using email, send it to the Netherlands, which would then send it to the internet. From the internet, we would get a response, which would get printed on the printed page. So the printed page in an analog space was working as the interface between people who had no access to the internet and people who did. So there are many ways in which it can be done. But I think it's a very pertinent question. The audience has to have a voice. The, uh, I think that you have to find your audience or create your audience. I don't think you want to respond to the audience in the sense that on television you figure out, you know, how can I get the most people to see this? What exactly should I produce for the eyes? You know, that'll, that'll make me the most money. I don't think that's the way you work, and it's certainly a very unsatisfying way. <clears throat> so I think the answer is not, I mean, partially you need to be aware of what the audience wants. That may affect your strategy. But I think it's just you do the work and control, not control, um, find the audience, create the audience. There's so many people there. You can, you can find people who will be interested in what you do if you're effective. Yeah, I mean, I think fundamentally this is the thing that's really interesting and defining about social media is that it's social. You know, the audience isn't the audience. The audience talks back. And then we're not, you know, the speakers and the audience anymore. Then it's a community. And the kind of the analog, ver sorry, the analog version of this was like, I have the microphone and you don't have a microphone. So you get to talk when I decide to give you the microphone, if I decide <laughs> to give you the microphone. And yes, now <laughs> we've had a leveling force. You have a microphone and I have a microphone and, you know. I'm going to talk on a personal experience. Did the book on trading to extinction about the illegal animal trade. Lens did a, a feature on it. Yeah, it touched quite a few people. Um, the book has been quite successful, but it's only 1,100 copies have been made. 
maybe 2,000 people are going to see this in its, its life in the sense, you know. Um, then it sort of got onto Instagram, and 450,000 people liked one image. Maybe a few hundred, maybe a couple of million people saw it. So for a campaign element, I think it's just, I think in some ways it's a really good tool for a campaign voice. Not necessarily for these intimate stories that you're talking about, James, but more getting the message out to a, an audience that would never get to see it. I think that's where the tool is very, it gets, it gets a great load of traction that you would normally not get. I think Absolutely. in some sort of ways. And that's my two bobs off anyway. Any other questions? Um, I just wanted to ask a bit of a two-part question going back to the start. I'm Lindsay from Australia. Um, <laughs> we're annoying Patrick. Um, it, it was talking earlier about um, there was a disagreement of whether you should wait till a project is finished or um, you know dis distribute it as you're working on it. And I wanted you to maybe talk of some examples uh, from 2014, the one that's popping up in my mind the most is Anastasia Taylor Lind, Negative Zero, and her come along with me on my van trip, um, Facebook page, Instagram, and all that sort of stuff. Um, and the second part of that question being, do you have any, um, you know, weight with something like that, if you wanted to start something like that, if in fact you're not at that level that Anastasia already has in terms of fame and I think they're both fabulous. I mean, I think that they're really good uses of social media in a project. And I mean, I, I didn't want to, you know, no way am I opposed to social media. I think Instagram, it's one of, it's really our best friend. <laughs> you know, we have power that we never had before. <clears throat> I was merely talking about certain projects and timing. That's all. Um, so that, that's all I'm saying. I'm saying not every single project, but the, the thing is it gives it, it's not just when work being seen because it's not passive. The work becomes a tool to something greater just like what you did on bass track. So um, I would, you know, for mo many, many purposes take advantage of it. I mean, I, almost all purposes. I'm just talking about timing of releasing work. But because it, it brings us beyond being a photographer. You know, it used to be um, you did the work and you, if you were really lucky, someone would push it two years later. And uh, some people would see it, um, and that would be it. If it was in a newspaper, they'd see it, and then it's, you know, it's, it's, it lines the, the birdcage the next day. You know, now, photography is just part of your ability to communicate and influence people uh, in a way that was never available before. So it's, you know, it's, I'm, thank, you know, I just think it's the greatest thing. I don't think, you know, I think there's times to, you know, that may be not what's right for you, what you want to accomplish. But I think, um, I find it liberating, uh, particularly, not so much in my case, but for individual photographers to get published. Two things I'd like to add. One which we haven't touched upon, which I think is quite relevant, because I think this, you're right about how many does the printed copy reach, but in fact, there is another s way of looking at it. We brought out a book uh, a couple of years back called Positive Light, which we did through crowdsourcing. Publishing is not so easy now these days. Finding a publisher, someone to pay for it. Social media can actually be used to ensure that there is birth of a book, which might not otherwise see the light of day. So there is um, that very interesting aspect to it. But I, I would like to bring up another aspect. I think what social media does, not only is it reach spread in terms of numbers, I think spread in terms of diversity. Because many different types of people will engage with the photograph than traditionally would have happened. And certainly if you bring out a photo book, certainly a large number of the people who would buy it or get it would be people who are photographers or interested in photography. And I think it needs to go much further. And I'm of the opinion that photography is far too important to be left to photographers alone. Uh, and that's what social media can allow. Yeah, I mean, I guess the original question that you asked originally was, I think, what is the role of photographers in all of this photography? 
and it's you know, it feels like an incredibly interesting moment to me. Sorry, this is really big. Um, <laughs> it's a really interesting moment in uh, where you have a generation of, of of these people who dedicated their lives to the practice of this of this of this thing, and suddenly hundreds of millions of people came online, and it feels like overnight, and they're they're fascinated with this thing. And to me, this, this is the thing that really kind of like keeps me fascinated. Like, what happens at this kind of this transition point? Like, are all of these people who literally spent like decades working on this thing just going to disappear in this kind of tsunami of, of, of new arrivals? And I think that's the thing that we don't want to happen. I mean, I think this DNA, you know, should live. And, and flourish in the next in the next era, but this is kind of like, you know, where a river flows into the ocean. It's not where the water ends, obviously. You know, it's 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 a different existence. But I think that's you know, from our perspective, there's a tendency to think like the world ended because our river ended. It's we just entered a much bigger space. media always capture what is happening, always most of them time a negative information. But with this power of uh, internet communication technology and and the you know Instagram, we can bring the positives. But unfortunately the audience, the huge citizens, they don't know. They just want to share their you know the moments. But that moments one photos might be useful for scientists, could be useful for the policymaker, or could be useful for the head of the states. So I mean now uh, I'm just a little bit uh, not confused, not sure that whose road we captured those, you know, uh, the linkage. Is it the computer scientist who should be developing new apps, or it should be the photographer artist who will be pushing this boundary that photography is not an isolated island; it should be part of other discipline as well, because we do represent all kinds of discipline. And at the end, how it really changed society—that should be our role. Do you want to come in? Yeah, let's take another question here. <laughs> Australia has had two goes, so you wait your turn. Yeah. <laughs> um, hi, my name is my name is Bei Yin. I suppose I just want to comment about um, you know this great, huge democrati democratization of photography. Uh, I have thought about it, and I suppose it's just my perspective. Um, I think in the past, like everybody couldn't read or write, and suddenly everybody could read, and then maybe everybody's like worried that literature is going to die. So I think like the way I see it is like, yes, everybody can take photos now. Everybody has the power to tell their own stories, like citizen journalism. But um, in terms of photography, just like great literature, um, I think you know, we don't have anything to worry that the DNA will die off. Australia. <laughs> I, th I think my point, what I was... Chauvinist. Yes. <laughs> My point being is I think it's, it's a tool, it's a mechanism, it, sh it doesn't cover everything. Um, I, I'm afraid I can't remember the photographer's name, he's a Spanish gentleman that uh, he did the book called Pigs, which is, it, stand, it was a total takeoff of The Economist. And the, he had exactly the same uh, letterhead or the mask head with the red block in the corner. And in, instead of The Economist, he said The Pigs, and it stands for Portugal, Italy, Greece and Spain because The Economist coined the phrase The Pigs. So he did a book, which is this, which is an identical copy of The Economist. He just thought outside the box, and this book became quite very popular to the point where The Economist did a run about it. And he would lay it into uh, the bookshops in international airports, and he would put it there, and he had a barcode and everything. So people would go up to the counter and pay for it, thinking they were getting an Economist, but they got a pig. So the point to it is, the traditional print media isn't dead, far from it. You've just got to think differently. You've got to think out of the box to get your message across. And, and Instagram and the, the social medias, if you want to put them all into one envelope, are just one tool or one gear in that mechanism to spread the word, if you want to spread a word. That's my two bobs. Of th it's more Any of a statement, other questions? not a question. Yeah, right at the back. I 
let's take some questions in and then we'll do the others, yeah. Uh, my question is to Alam Bhai that uh, the example you gave about the degree of control uh, of uh, how the photo is being used, that you said the farmer has zero control. So what can be done uh, to ensure that the farmer has more control? And what uh, is the role of the photographer uh, in this? I'd like to invite Shihan to talk on this, if you like, because he's done something which you should really know about. Okay. I'm Shihab. Uh, I'm a personal alumni and used to teach over there. Now I'm teaching in the Griffith and doing my doctorate over there. So, yeah, thank you to raise the issue. So, and I also questioned myself uh, two, three years back, that same thing, and I started my own project which I actually was living with three families and giving them all the authority to representation, to choose the images, and even editing process. And I also do the, my first show, which is going on now in Kamlapu, in uh, where they're living. And it's not easy. It's a dilemma. Because if you see as a photographer, we think that they don't have language. They do have their own language, which is completely different than what we think as a photographer, what James like people like James think as an editor. So, it, but still, I think it's something is going on because we these days we all are thinking about this millions and millions of photos we uploaded in Facebook or in magazine. But the people who are who are being photographed did not know anything. So, what is I think that as a photographer we need to think about that how much we got benefited or the society got benefited from the for people we being photographing. And if we question that, I believe that in some point, the relationship we're going to build with that is going to change the attitude towards to all the three components here, the people being photographed, the photographer, and the editor. And it's a journey, and it's not easy to deal with, and it's not a a smooth journey, but I believe that it will going to be changed. You should, the show's still up. You should go. It's near Platform 8 in Kamlapu Station on the, on the grid, just stuck up there on polythene things. It's worth going to see for sure. But I'll, I'll come to you, but I'll just respond to your question in how we as an agency tried to do that, because that's another in-between situation. In... In the late 80s, um, we were very involved in a movement to bring down General Ashad. This is a general who'd taken over power. For once, Army League and BNP were together, uh, trying to uh, bring down this general. We were taking pictures throughout that period um, because it was important to be documented. We sent these pictures all across the globe. No one was interested. Yeah? A democratic movement in Bangladesh just wasn't sexy. 29th of April, there's a big cyclone, and suddenly the whole world wants pictures from Bangladesh. Yeah. New York Times, it was Nancy Lee at that time, the deputy picture editor, uh, she wrote to us to say they wanted some, even sent us sample pictures, you know, do you have these? The usual sort of pictures, dying people, horrific pictures and all that. And we went back to the New York Times to say, yes, we had those pictures, but we didn't think that was the story. We felt the story had moved on, and there was another story to be told. And Nancy Lee responded to say, well, tell us what it is. So we did, we sent pictures of reconstruction. We sent pictures of working together. We, we had pictures of farmers replanting seeds, of fishermen fixing their boats, going back out, of people's resilience, of people's tenacity, of people build, rebuilding their lives, which until that point had not been shown. And then we had a spread on I think it's called the Weekend in Review or something like that. There's a Weekend yeah, Week in Review. There's a full page in the New York Times which published our photo story. And as far as I remember of that time, that was the only photo essay I saw which d didn't dwell on bodies. It could be done. But of course, from our point of view, we took a risk. Here's a big client, New York Times. They want those pictures. And I have to decide whether I'm going to try and sell them something else 
and take a risk of maybe they backing off. They are a big client. But I think it can be done. And this was a very good example. The reason they want those pictures is probably because that's the only thing they know about that situation. And we, on the ground, also have a responsibility to educate people along that chain. And I think, at least in that case, it could be done. And it's happened time and time again. Yeah, I, was, I was just going to say, and there's an also, uh, with Shehab's work, there's an opening on Friday in another location. Because there's three locations where, where he lived with the families and three different families. I think that's the thing, we, you know, it's where we started in a way with this idea that, to me, this is the fundamental shift where the situation was once that you had to convince that publisher to take the alternate narrative that you had in mind. And if they couldn't be convinced, end of story. And the way the story was driven was that somebody on the other side of the planet calls you and tells you what you're supposed to have seen here. Now that's f flipped or equalized in a way in that when you publish, the broadest reach is on platforms that neither of you own but are open to both of you. And most likely, when that person calls you, they've call they're calling you because they've already seen what you've already published yourself. And so that, that kind of perception that narrative isn't being driven from a cubicle on the other side of the planet. And I think that's that's the the kind of the optimistic piece of this for me.